So today I've got um, Hans Cook from Barks and Books FA. So Hans, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this for a taking us a few weeks to to get to get it down, and we're here now. Um, so really appreciate this. Just can we kick off by who you are, what you do, who you do it for, and why you do it? Yeah, of course. Perfect. No, thanks, Danny. Um, again, really looking forward to this conversation. So I'm yeah, business support is is my role at Barks and Bucks FA. So the administration side of things, really. Um, but yeah, so I've been there just coming up to two years. Um, that's my career in football. This was my first kind of, should we say, foot in the door. But it's a sport that I've loved for since I can remember. Um, and it's always been a passion. So when the opportunity came up to, to work within the game, um, I just thought I'd take that take that leap. And uh, yeah, here I am. Here I am. Now. Brilliant. So um, looking at, yeah, I've done a bit of research on you. And, and I see that you've, you've got a master's degree in chemistry. That's correct. Yeah. Is that so, correct? How, do, how does that come about? You know, in, is it is it right <laughs> that it's drug drug discovery? Yeah. So it was a master's in chemistry for drug discovery. So as part of that as well, I did a year at GlaxoSmithKline, um, who are a big like big yeah. pharma basically yeah, yeah. pharmaceutical company. That was in Stevenage, their site. Yeah. So actually, for the year, I went down and saw a lot of the Stevenage games. Football's always been a part of it, whether it was my my yeah, yeah. career or whatever. I try to always get along to my local team, which is something we'll come on to, but. Yeah, so I, growing up, school was kind of, I didn't always have necessarily the easiest childhood, so right. to speak, in terms of my own story. So it was very unsettled. So parents kind of um, went for a divorce when I was about 10 years old, yeah. the age that I was starting secondary school. And for me, education was something I could control yeah. when there was a real lack of control around me. So um, so I kind of dived headfirst into my studies and academia and chemistry was a subject I just found I was pretty good at yeah and um I think because of that and I enjoyed you know getting the praise from the teachers or fellow students oh because it's a subject that a lot of people they see chemistry and they go a little bit like oh no that's this that's not that's, that's not for me um it's very complex isn't it you know yeah yeah complex and it's quite mathematical but again I've got quite a numbers brain I think mm. thinking numbers um so it was something I, I found I was good at and I just enjoyed being good at something, feeling like I had yeah. control. So that was what I went to study at university. Um, went to Union Bath, which I loved. Great city, um, really good um, sports sides as well. So I was nowhere near the football team at Bath Uni, but we did. Um, I played for chemistry football, so <laughs> not quite the same, but uh, that was my. <laughs> but um, yeah, I did score in the in the big derby against Natural Sciences, though. So. Hey, but anyway, <laughs> No one's going to listen to that. Um, but, but yeah, so but when I went to university, I went single-mindedly with I want to then go on and do a PhD and I want yeah. to become a doctor and I want to be an academic. I was very much on that path because that was what had given me validation. I'd felt like I was good at it. And yeah, so it, it wasn't necessarily a passion, it was it came from I found something I could control. Um so yeah, it was and then Ow. very sorry, yeah. So, sorry, just just Thank, thanks for you know sort of putting in there about your childhood and and, and what happened as someone of your age now and your experience how did that you know it's a traumatic thing parents splitting up you know my mum and dad did when I was six so I get I get you know what you're saying how did that affect you looking back now yeah so looking back now and through kind of the course of since I had my kind of experiences with mental health and have gone through some kind of therapy and really look back at that that part of my life um I realized it affected me a lot more than I probably mm. acknowledged or recognized yeah. uh, I think for me a big thing is and I spoke about it kind of um validation bit and so in the family home we we didn't necessarily so I've got a couple of sisters as well and so like we were just at home with mum so she was busy working a full-time job had three yeah. of us and so there wasn't really time for, you know, how was your day at school? How are you feeling? Mm. And so I've never really felt that my voice was necessarily mm. or how I felt was necessarily important. Um, and it comes down to that conditional love, conditional value. I had always seen it as, un as conditional, sorry, not unconditional. Yeah. Hence, oh, I wanted to do as good as I could at school and I wanted yeah. to go and get a, a PhD because I wanted people to see me. And I wanted people to know that, you know, I'm here and yeah. I'm important. And um, and so 
I was there's a lot of pressure I put on myself and I'm still unlearning it now um and we say how busy I am with things I do work and then my podcast and then the cappuccino platform and then I volunteer at Didcot so I'm a busy person and I'm trying to unlearn that you don't always have to be be proving your worth to people and to myself um yeah that's probably something a big thing that's come from it which now I'm aware of it's it's like it was like a light bulb moment when I was like oh so that's why I also why when I was struggling I didn't ask for help because at home we'd never really had we didn't talk about feelings we didn't talk about things like that mm. I think like maybe because I'm not you know sort of talking you know talk about your family here but maybe in, in families that that happens to talk yeah I think there's like maybe an element of like survival mode you know so for your mum she's working and the first instincts are to ensure that you're you know warm clothed safe and and happy you know and, and then is the time for anything else around that when you bring in up only said you have two or three other sisters so i've got two sisters i'm two the oldest sisters. yeah two so youngest. three yeah. kids single parent working you know it, it's there's only so many hours in a day and there's only so much you can stack up here at can't you to deal with and and you know i, I totally get that and, and so you've been good at chemistry and finding something that you excelled in and that people would say hands yeah fantastic you know you and that gave you that I think like you said you mentioned there like this the self pro yeah. you know the self I can't remember the term you used but proving to yourself first that you were good or you were worthy and you could do something and then afterwards other people yeah definitely it was it was a lot proving to myself I think and and part of it was probably and, and I mean there's much I'm very grateful for the fact I went down that education route yeah. and that because there's other ways that people I don't want to use the term cry for help but like cry for attention it was yeah, almost yeah. like look at what I can do look look yeah. at what I'm doing but but then even now when I look back the times I was maybe told we're proud of you we love you etc they were only when I'd achieved something hmm. and yeah. that's definitely something that it was a learned behavior then that if yeah. my manager or if my colleagues yeah. or my partner is going to be proud of me, I have to keep achieving. Yeah, 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 I get that. Which is uh, is then a lot of pressure because you're constantly yeah, yeah. thinking yeah. what I do here. But I think you mentioned about um, that proving to myself. So a term I like is I kind of I created a story about myself that I am the chemistry guy and yeah. this is what this is my path and I created that character and created that story and so when that then came away which was, I guess, another big part of my story. When the, then I moved away from that, that was the hardest thing. That was the internal yeah. conflict of who am I? Yeah, who am I now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so what? So, how did you? How did you come away from where you, what you were doing, to what to to the next step? What 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 triggered that? What made that happen? Was it a conscious decision? And then, what things were you fighting internally when that happened? so being honest that it wasn't a conscious decision it was a it was a, a have to really mm. um it was through burnout um just had a, a breakdown basically yeah. um so i'd then gone and got a place on a phd i was i was absolutely buzzing i was like i'm on this path that i'd said yeah. i was gonna gonna create i was only 21 i'd got on a phd won awards at uni and then suddenly you go from a place where you can kind of stand out maybe by just hard work and by effort mm -hmm. so then on a PhD program and the nature of research it's not always going to work mm -hmm. and I couldn't I couldn't disconnect the experiments and the chemistry failing from me failing right but my coping mechanism was to do more hours was to, to do mm -hmm. more work and after about six months of doing probably seven till seven six days a week no annual leave no holidays my body just yeah. you know it was catching up with me yeah. and I said I'll take one day off um to my professor took one day off and I, I never went in the lab again like right. my body as soon as I stopped it was like yeah. yeah I allowed myself to stop and it all just caught up with me and then thankfully have good people around me my partner who I'm still with now um friends and etc had a good circle but the conflict for me was realizing that I didn't love this science I didn't love this passion when I realized I'd created this all because I wanted validation yeah it was a real big internal conflict that was the hardest thing um so yeah it was a tough time um ended up 
been off work afterwards for about six months had a period mm-hmm. of time just you know signed off basically um and at that point it was it was still difficult there was almost that shame that guilt because yeah yeah, yeah. people all the friends i'd had through university that was what they knew me for um, but i think something and something i would advise anyone really um is that you know those stories we create of ourselves and the people around you it's a, it's a bit of a cliche but like those who matter don't mind and those who mm. mind don't matter in terms yeah. of the fact that i wasn't going to go on this yeah. journey the people who really are important to me and that that know me for who i am they didn't they didn't care yeah, yeah. they didn't care that i wasn't going to get this qualification and as soon as i realized that it, it helped me to you know get back on my feet a little bit. yeah like a burden got another burden gone because it's that worrying about other people which we all do don't we and yeah. and yeah. I, I said to my missus i said my wife and i said to my son i said you know the greatest freedom is not giving a stuff what people <laughs> think about you and that's not being disrespectful to people and not yeah. doing things that are wrong it's just not having that concern that what will people think if you're a good person you you know you and, and you just you know you, you live life and don't hurt others why yeah. do you why should you care what people think you know and and and, and it's like I think like those that, you know, I think I think sometimes we're conditioned by society to not stand out, aren't we? You know, to, to, to fit into the pack. But then if you look at people who as individuals or society we look up to, they're all people that have broke from the pack, aren't they? Yeah. You, that's, you, know, you know, so everyone that you think, oh, they, she's good, they're great. That They're all ones that have, that have put themselves above the parapet and mm. done something. It's the only time you can do something brilliant. And I don't mean... You know cure a disease it just means do something that you're that you're good at you have yeah. to put yourself out there don't you and it's like you with the, the podcast i'm sure yeah. that at the start were pretty scary yeah yeah definitely it's it's putting yourself in a position to you know you say like putting your head above the yeah head above the trenches almost and head yeah. above the, the standard pack and you're you're putting yourself out there so there is that vulnerability and i'm doing something different i'm new there's going to be mistakes it's not going to be perfect but you know i think you've got to take that risk to to get success and otherwise as you say you're just always a part of the pack um yeah and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that again and i don't we, we there's nothing wrong with being part of the pack i just think that you know we've all got to try and think what we're good at and try and do it and i think the majority of people don't follow that path because they're scared of what people might think and and it is it's and it's I'm not saying that's wrong because I I'm like that I you know as as I don't care what people think there's still parts of what I do that I'm thinking <laughs> you know should I should not you know and and it's human nature but I think those that that do that get to know the self better I think as well you know because it, it's the greatest freedom ever I think not caring what people think it is I really yeah. think that yeah it is, it is, there's elements that i'm that i'm there I, with certain things obviously it's still it's it's, it's human nature to to kind of to, yeah. to think about that and particularly at the moment well i say at the moment or this day and age with so much yeah social media there's i mean i i certainly have made real connections and i'm very grateful for social media because um i guess during that time when i was off that's when yeah. i created cappuccino which right. is um for those listening who, who aren't aware so basically it's just a small it started as an instagram page basically yeah it was going to be reviewing cafes in oxford because that's um did, did cots where we were living at the time and um, still am now just near oxford so i needed something to get me up on my feet get me out of the house yeah like, feel like a purpose because i've yeah. always been a purpose person i was just on the wrong path i told myself my purpose was this yeah. this chemistry but actually i am um, yeah have now found it is mental health awareness hence we're sat here it's amazing yeah, yeah. conversation particularly in a football space yeah um but I yes yeah, so I started this Instagram page I didn't have my face to it or my name to it because I there was a little bit of that shame and guilt still yeah. and I just wanted to review cafes um and then started to say a little bit about oh I'm doing this because I'm signed off work yeah I got a bit of a passion for coffee as well as football and then those posts got traction and again it's like you said going right back to the start of when we were chatting it might even be before we hit record you say people love people people want to hear about people's stories and and that's what really connects us um which is amazing and i think that's what football's so good at as well is crossing language barriers crossing socioeconomic barriers 
We universal. Love universal, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we love the game. We love the game. And, and um, yeah, so that has now grown. It's about five years ago now, um, but it's grown to having the podcast. I've got my own coffee blend with a roaster in Oxford, Jericho Coffee Roasters. Proceeds go to a local mental health charity, Restore. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also a sponsor at Digcott Town Football Club. Yeah. They've now got a charity partnership with a local mental health charity. And this community has all kind of built from me starting an Instagram page when I really felt at my lowest and yeah. taking that risk and saying, yeah. actually, this is a passion. Maybe I should just dip my feet in and see what yeah. happens. That's validation. Every time someone yeah. likes a post or comments yeah. on a post or listens to your podcast or buys your coffee, it's validation. Yeah. And, and it's a good feeling, isn't it? It's like, it's a, you know, you think, yeah, I can do this or it is making a difference or it does work. And I want Daft to think that it's it's a good idea. And that's a validation, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's also lovely that people care for a start, yeah. but the people, the likes are great, the shares are great, the engagement's great. But the, the, the thing that's really been amazing is people that I've met, connections from that. Yeah. I've had people that I met on its on instagram and then we've then gone and become real friends but also yeah. messages from people some people i've known maybe people i went to school with people who knew me at that time when i was yeah. uh before i was aware of who i really was in the mental health and them saying how oh it's amazing to see or i've been struggling with this or that and that's the things that are amazing seeing yeah because you don't know it's sim similar with yourself and the vault and football mental health alliance you're never really going to know the the size of the impact yeah. that you're making no no you just go with your gut don't you and you know you think yeah yeah i think i think there's something here i'm gonna go for it and 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 you do and uh, i like yourself you like yourself you know you, you make mistakes on the way i've i've worked for myself for longer than i can remember and mm. it you know like in any experience in life you know there's more kicks in nether regions than there are praise and Come, you know everything like that but it just teaches you so much and it's the best thing I've ever done because it, it, it allowed me to get to know myself you know it, it did it did you know and 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 I look back and think you know at time you think why is this happening and I can look back now and I know exactly why it was happening and what it's given me you know sometimes when you're going through the storm you don't you don't see that do you um and, and what a, a good quote I saw was things happen for me not to me and sometimes when you know you didn't you didn't I have a stop you don't always see that but when you look back and you think yeah I know I know why that happened and I know what it's given me and I know what it's allowed me to move on to next so um I know like you've mentioned before that for obviously football's a passion of yours and things how you know and uh, you've mentioned that football has helped you through tough times and, and such like can you expand on how football has served as a, as a support system for your mental health and how being part of a community has made a difference yeah, definitely. I think for me, the two are almost synonymous, football mm. and community. They, they've been my communities. It's, and again, maybe it, it makes so much sense now when I think about my journey and my, my childhood, particularly about that feeling a part of something. And I don't, and often I know maybe people don't like the term family for workplaces, et cetera, because yeah. it's not a family really, because, you know, it, it's a bit different. Um, but in terms of the football, like family, community, yeah. just people who from different walks of life, um, different ages and you go there and you just all have this shared yeah. passion and support your team and and I think for me um, I noticed how important it was maybe when I made friends with people who were also willing to be vulnerable at, yeah. the, at the game if that makes sense yeah. and that yeah, yeah, yeah. is a real big part for me or I've got a couple of friends so I'm a Wickham fan um, for my sins um, if any Reading fans listening we, you know we're <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, I'm just not going to that. There's a whole, there's a whole story there. But um, no, so but there's a couple of friends who I made just from going to the football, and we have a little routine where we'll just meet up, go to a local coffee shop, um, have our lunch, and just chat and see yeah. how we're doing, and then and then we go to the game. And I would never have met those people if I didn't yeah. have have the football. Um, so I think that's that's something that's big for me. Um, and now even at, at so Didcot Town, which is a club that I'm involved at. And um, the club has helped make the town feel like a home for me. Yeah, yeah. Because that's where all my like you know connections are, or you know, and even now if I'm seeing someone you know just in the supermarket or something, it's nice to have friendly faces where you live. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not always see someone you know. Make friends. 
I think. Yeah. It's um, I think like for me, like some people that you know don't follow or are involved in football think it's just about those people on that grass pitch playing a mm. game. And like you've alluded to there, it's not match day is a is a is a the, the, the game sometimes is just the thing that's happening, you know, what happens before, what happens after. So you'll get some people, you know, your classic football fan is going to the pub for a few before meeting the mates, going for a few after. But now things have changed, haven't they? And like you say, you know, you'll go to a coffee shop, have a meal, have a chat. And that's come about because of 22 people on a football pitch kicking a ball about. So there's so much more that football gives us, I feel. I do, you know, and and so how how did it help you then? How did it how did it help you in, in that place where you were? So I think for me, it was amazing to, when I've been in my darkest times and, and so I've I've been diagnosed with depression and anxiety, mm. something that I live with is uh, the, the both can be challenging because yeah. depression almost sometimes makes you feel like you don't care. And then anxiety makes you feel like you care too much. <laughs> There's this conflict in my head. Um, so, so yeah, and, but one of the hardest things for me or, and people may be able to relate to this is doing activities or doing things that you would normally find joy in or find yeah. energy from or passion in and, and maybe not not feeling that again yeah and i certainly have had that in times with activities even at times playing football but for me that watching the game would always just spark something in me i don't know if it's just come from when i was younger uh, that team and it matters because it doesn't matter as yeah, well yeah 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 like, no i've got a lot better now if my team wins or loses as long as i enjoy the game it's fine yeah, um, yeah. i know it's not always the case and we football's an emotional game it's part of mm. why we love it. but it it helped me just to feel mm. just watching the results or being able to share conversations even if I didn't have the energy to yeah. you know really go into the deep conversations mm. with friends and at times when I was kind of felt a bit cut off from the world yeah. because someone would message me oh did you see the game and, and so though it for me it's been a really really big um big big part of my life um even at, at times when I've maybe, you know, not had much of an appetite for life at times, there's always that little bit of appetite for football and it's kept how, me. How did you do, how did you overcome that though, Hans? How did you, you know, because I'm thinking, you know, obviously we all have anxiety manifests itself in different ways, as, as does depression in, in different, in, in all different, in all of us. And I went to a, I went to a, spoke at a, meet, a breakfast meeting on mental health this week. And one of the people there said, you know, at some point we all have some form of depression. You know, so yeah, and I don't, and I don't mean to sound disrespectful to people that you know yeah. are suffering and, and 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 things like that. And it made me think that you know that yeah, I, I get that. But but what did you do when you were in that place when you thought you know I really imagine you know anxiety sometimes not wanting to leave the house mm -hmm. depression having the i don't really care about something that I, that i love so much and that doesn't necessarily have to be football it can be anything in life what did you do how did you how did you overcome that yeah so i think the yeah it's it's interesting one to because there's obviously it's it's an ongoing journey and yeah it's it's something that i will be living with for the rest of my life yeah. but certainly having those coping mechanisms i think the biggest thing was accepting it yeah well recognizing it and then accepting it were, yeah. were the two biggest things and again that only came from when i had that kind of breakdown burnout um for, so for the first 22 years of my life i didn't really know what mental health was I, no I, it wasn't something i'd ever been educated on and hadn't needed to be because in my mind i was you know all good and yeah. i was on this path to become you know a mm. great scientist let's say. yeah 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 <laughs> That was what I cared about. Um, but I think the biggest thing is talking um, and sharing how I was feeling yeah. um, and accepting that, as I say, with myself um, before I could accept it with others. A big part of that was therapy. Um, so yeah. I've been through, yeah, a number of different kind of state ch chunks of therapy in my time. Um, and yeah, just really getting stuff off my chest, sharing yeah. it and just speaking in a way that is, you know, you're not going to be judged. Um, yeah. And often with close ones, with loved ones, you're not going to be judged. No, it's something no. If you're in that space, you say about in that storm that what you need is to speak to someone who's completely removed from your life. Yeah. Um, 
so that's helped but I think as well um helping others really helps me yeah um in that way it's sense of seeing like maybe the messages from people saying oh it's it's great to know I'm not alone in this and I'm great yeah. to know so for me that kind of happiness can be like providing happiness or, or to others yeah um, yeah yeah definitely. I mean, like, I'm not I'm not the most important but like it's important to give um and share my story helps um whether it helps me because it's cathartic and it's almost therapeutic yeah. To, yeah to talk about how I'm feeling but at the same time being vulnerable and seeing that that allows vulnerability in others yeah um so yeah it, I don't know if that's really answered the question no um, no I, I I totally get that but two examples like you know my, my, at the minute I was speaking to my my best friend yesterday and his his wife she's uh, going through chemotherapy for breast cancer they've had a horrendous time as anyone does that's you know going through that type of thing and she's just finished her last session today and I've seen a whatsapp come through and I, and I think it's going to be her ringing the bell you but they do you know when they've when they've gone through yeah, the session yeah, yeah, yeah. and he said to me today he said she's thinking about diarising it and I said tell her to do it because it'll help so many people he said she didn't want to do it during because she didn't want sympathy and she, yeah. she you know but now she's done it she said she I said tell her to do it all I said because my wife previously had uh, ulcerative colitis and, and we found her old blog uh, that she did 10 years ago and the amount of comments on there from thank you so much I thought it was only me you know, classic and what people say about mental health I thought they were only me and I thought yeah. and I, just do it because it helps you because you're getting things off your chest and then that 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 feeling that you get from others coming back to you and saying that you've helped them doubly yeah. helps you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And I think, um, no, and that's amazing news about your your mate's um, wife as well. And hopefully, as you say, um, all the best to her. And, and um, yeah, but diarising it 100% because even, and like I think that with the podcast or yeah. some of the, I've always, it's funny, I'm not the best at journaling, but I feel my platform is almost an online journal for yeah. me. That's yeah. my way of doing yeah. it. As long as, and that's what I think to people as well. Don't put pressure on yourself. Yeah. Do it a certain way. Whatever works for you. Yeah. As long as it's getting it out of your head and onto the yeah. page or onto yeah. it. Yeah. Then that's that's amazing. But yeah, and I feel better. I feel like it's weightlifting. Yeah. Then yeah, like you said, it's um people coming back to it. Great. That's an added bonus. Um, but for me, yeah, it's so important to to really like reflect on how you yeah. are feeling what genuinely gives you joy what genuine what mm. you genuinely love doing um and you would love doing if no one was watching or mm. no one was, you know judging you for it um that and just do more of those things really yeah. it's like self-therapy you know. isn't it you know it's like yeah. you know sometimes you, you know we, know we can't always see a counselor or a therapist for a number of reasons but that self-therapy like you said i think really good point of like what you said there is about people talk about journaling and it is brilliant but sometimes it's sitting down and writing it where you, you hit the nail on the head. What we can do nowadays is just speak into a phone and put that out in it, whatever form we feel on, you know, online. And, and, and it's just as powerful. Yeah. I've got friends. I don't who or I know of who sometimes will even just record a voice note. Don't send it to yeah. an audience. Yes. To yes. Someone, and they just listen back to it themselves. And yeah. even if you don't listen to it, just saying it, the act of speaking it, you kind of, clear the head and it gets it off off your chest i've had it even with if i'm struggling with something or feel like i've made a bit of a mistake at work or something because it happens yeah. um but great relationship with my manager but almost an example like it was friday just gone the week before um where there was something in my head and i was a bit like oh this is going to sit with me all weekend so i just sent an email just said almost like you don't need to reply yeah i'm just letting you know yeah i know this happened i know this is what look we learned from it yeah great weekend it's good done yeah. but the fact that sent it just made me feel like okay that, yeah. I'm not going to be sitting with that all weekend and then actually when we then had a, a meeting this week um again there wasn't a reply but then started the meeting oh I really appreciate you sending yeah. that because it's then also my manager saying okay he's acknowledging the mistake yeah. that was made accepting yeah. responsibility for it yeah. and we don't have to then have that awkward do we bring yeah. it up do we yeah 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 because yeah. you'd also then I think as well when you when you've got something that you want to get out there the longer you don't deal with it the worse it gets you know and, and my I've got a friend of mine and he's a 
guy called Brad Burton, and he's one of UK's uh, leading motivational speakers. And and he's he's got a saying that I love, and it's stuck with me for years. And it's the longer you run, the weaker you become. And that's the principle of that. You know, like if you want to send that email, yep. it's going to sit with you. So you're running away from this thing that you want to get off your chest and you haven't. And it's going to and, and sometimes you just get and it's never as bad as what you think, is it? Nothing yep. is ever as bad as what you think. And that simple act of yep. getting it out, however it is, just it, it sort of frees you, doesn't it? So how did you get yep. into uh, working at County FA then? How did that come about? Yeah, so so actually, so once obviously I had that bit of period outside of work, um, I got back into work and it was initially through a charity. Um, so got back into working for them, um, Cancer Research UK. So um, yeah, it's a cause that's amazing. I, I definitely felt like I, once I'd gone from this whole research thing, I was like, I know people was my passion really. Yeah. The people thing and that kind of explained to me why I was getting so worked up because when you're in a lab and etc it was it was quite isolating so wanted to work in the people space so I got a job at cancer research and it was brilliant it was three years there um, and wasn't really looking to move on but then I saw this opportunity come up in the local county FA yeah. um, and put my hat in the ring and just thought you know what I feel like the role was similar so I was doing operational support at the charity and I've gone into like business support yeah in the football so it's a similar role but just in a field which I mean football you know so a lot of people you know as a kid say oh I want to be a footballer yeah but I've obviously had that period of that yeah but just being involved in the game and it is just yeah. something that, that I've always loved so an opportunity to get my foot in the door there would have been would have been amazing interviewed like yeah got on really well with the team and, and, and came in so it's about two years now um that I've been there and like I say the role is business support but I've grown I would say in my own confidence and yeah. in the role and the impact I can make, I've, I feel like I've grown quite a lot since getting in there to now being, and I think that's probably where you kind of reached out and, and we kind mm. of as a um, uh, mental health ambassador for the campaign. Mm. Um, and that's but it something. shows by shows by putting yourself out there that people, it's obvious, mm. but that's that's why you, when you do it, you think, bloody hell, I'm so glad I did that because opportunities yeah. come, don't they? So now you're in the world of uh, grassroots football though. From your yep. perspective, how, what role can grassroots play in supporting mental health within clubs yep. and communities? I think it's massive. I think it is massive. I mean, the importance that physical activity can have for mental health for a start. Um, just if we're providing a space and I mean, I don't know the fact I know that we have around 80,000 participants. Right. In our county. Yeah. Across players, volunteers, um, coaches. Everything. Yeah. So that's that's it's a large number we're one of the larger county FAs and, and we all know the stats about kind of like one in four people mental health yeah. I say so 20,000 people potentially that are involved in the game in our county yeah. that that are experiencing these challenges and they'll be the, the figures are probably higher than the stats suggest yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a the fact that it's giving them maybe whether that's training volunteering we spoke about before how it's helped myself I know that I'm not unique in that um, that people have these clubs that are the heartbeat of, of communities and yeah. so much more than just the game um, and it's keeping people feeling a part of something the friendships the the sense of a belonging that football can bring is amazing um, and I think we're very aware of that or I'm very aware of that in in our, my role and, and the role of the organization is mm. you know yes we're there to make sure football happens but really it's to make sure it's like a welcoming environment it's a safe environment and, mm. and people can really thrive and and you know gain those skills as well that i think so for example young people playing the game you, it's a safe environment hopefully to, to mm. make mistakes and learn that that's okay yeah yeah you know, your teammates have got your back you know you can you can you can uh try again you go again um mm. so yeah so much it can do um and so i think it's it's important and there obviously is the the flip side of sometimes it can be you know there are that there's with every positives there are yeah. there are negatives as yeah. well um we would talk in before we hit, hit go about discipline levels behavior yeah. in football is a real hot topic at the moment um off the back of the lockdowns but it seems to still be following that trend mm. um and again part of that maybe is because it's a release for people um mm. they they're in best if life is stressful if life's getting down but a big thing i would say is that football's not an excuse to behave no. poorly 
yeah. football's not an excuse to behave a certain way if you weren't yeah. in that football environment would you do that on the street would you yeah. do that yeah in the classroom because yeah. yeah. kids a lot of the time as well it's youth football so yeah that's a, that's a really good analogy that Hans it's like when you said about how good it is for your mental health I what frustrates me is when I see, you know, certainly well in any any age group, but certainly yeah. in kids football, adults on the sideline being so vocal that they're actually suppressing the the kids' confidence, ability, right. um, demeanor, personality because they're so scared to make a mistake or put a tackle in. You know, I, I've seen it where where a tackle goes in and it's a it's a it's a tackle not wrong with it and half at sideline who are all grown adults ooh, and it and it's like the kids what are you doing to them let it go you know and it frustrates me so much that they don't understand what impact that is having on on those young people it, it, it's so frustrating for me as a as a parent as a coach as a used to be a player it, it, i don't get it why, why do you think have you got any ideas of why that might happen well, I mean, if we had the answers to that, we could solve that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that'd be brilliant. But I think, and I kind of mentioned before how football for a lot of people can be a release. Yeah. And I think for the people who maybe are behaving that way, um, look, maybe it's, you know, it's, if, if, if life stressful is something that mm. maybe if they could, they would they would love to in the workplace, you know, turn around and shout at someone mm. or yeah, shout yeah. Up, yeah. email, difficult call, difficult yeah. meeting. But it's, they know they can't there's they maybe feel there's more consequence mm. there and it's you know for some reason and because it's there's a long history of football and hooliganism and the behavior yeah. like yeah. there is yeah. association almost and i think it's why i said about football's not an excuse like well just because that's always been the case doesn't yeah. mean that we want that to yeah. carry on being the way um so they feel that on the football pitch there's that it's okay to, to let I think, out yeah i think you bang on there i think you bang on where the you know the professional game it is acceptable to shout at the ref or tell the other the opposition you, know you hear some of the chants that go on yeah exactly know. and i think you're right I'm, i think i think the part of it is that it's it's carried through into the into the professional game and people think well it, that's football but it's not is it you know it, it's yeah. so, so what do you think there's any 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 do you see any barriers in football regarding the conversation around mental health i think one of the biggest ones and we hear it sometimes is oh it's an emotional game yeah. In terms of this is a almost to, as an excuse for the behaviour. They're like, yeah. oh, I got caught up in the emotions and yeah. and you know, oh, it's an emotional game. Um, but again, that it's thinking about and you said about the words and the impact that can have on other people. Again, yeah. your behaviour, your actions is gonna impact others. Mm. And just because you're letting out an emotion and maybe you feel better for it, mm. you can't just put that onto someone else. Referees, for example, you know, they also go yeah. home and they have kids and a wife and a, yeah, this that and the other. And I mean. A big barrier, though, as well, is um, the pressure that comes from it being a competitive sport. Yeah. I think we see this even at the youth level sometimes, you know, it's a cup game, it's a cup yeah. final. Yeah. So, suddenly, so throughout the whole season, you might be, we do equal playing time, everyone's equal, like we want a player, and then sometimes you'll get to like the semi finals and suddenly yeah. like bring a few ringers yeah. in, and it's like, now nah, we're here yeah, to win yeah. suddenly. And yeah. How does that make people feel who, oh, sorry, you're not playing this weekend because yeah. the player from the first is coming down in? Yeah. So suddenly you feel you know and how does that make them feel and, and so I think the pressure is a big one um but I think a barrier as well is that particularly at grassroots level and we're indebted to volunteers who are amazing but if you're a volunteer and you're already taking up your time to then be a coach for a side mm. to then be told you've also got to look out for all these behaviors and you've got to yeah. to be responsible for for like the mental health of the children is a big it's a big ask and I think that's where things like the vault is perfect and it's yeah. again I don't want to put words in your mouth but where it's maybe come from is like we're not expecting volunteers and everyone to be the experts yeah. it's just knowing and having the confidence of where you can signpost yeah. and that's that's a big thing I think as well um, spot on, yeah it's yeah a barrier, spot on. I think a barrier is that people think oh it's too much it's too much pressure for me to, mm. to hold that responsibility for a team kind of thing it is, it's, it, you know, being involved in grassroots football is a big responsibility. Like you said, whether you're a, a even a player, a coach, a volunteer, a referee, you know, I, I've I've spoke to people before and I think like, you know, as a the referee is the most, it's the most loneliest place in football at any level. Because like if, if you're having a bad game or 
crowd, you do a bad pass and someone on sideline has a go at you. You've got your teammates to rally around. If you're coach, you've got the team. The ref, you, like you say, at the end of the day, you're sat in the middle of that pitch and you've got no team around you. You know, like professional refs they have, you know, assistant refs and the team. In grassroots, they don't. It's the most loneliest place in football. And it's, again, it goes back to, I think, you hit the nail on the head with refs, is that they get berated on TV by the pundits, by the fans, and it just follows through into Saturday afternoons and Sunday mornings. And and, and it's it's not on. It's not on, I don't think. Is is You know, as far as, like, football being a used to be a traditionally, you know, white working class male sport that has yep. obviously changed massively now and you know we've it's a it's a sport that encapsulates everyone as you said at the start no matter your background etc mm-hmm. do, do you do you do you see any stigma still in football around around mental health i think i think we do yeah i do think i think there is i think i think it's it's moving in the right direction and even the fact that, say, for example, last week, so as Bucks and Bucks FA, we did a an event with Wickham Wanderers Foundation. Yes. We did a mental health panel, um, mental health and football panel, um, and it was it was great. Um, yeah. it, like the fact that Wickham supported it, so we had two first team players down, David Wheeler and Brilliant. Jerry as well. So that was amazing, particularly as a Wickham fan. Yeah. You know, that little bit for me to be sat there talking to players at the club where I grew up and I fell in love with the game yeah yeah um, and those panels like that didn't exist when I was growing up yeah um, so um it was amazing but I think you know it was impactful in the room but when we think of I said about the 80,000 participants right yeah that we have in our county area and then you look at the numbers who came back and were interested and and like I think there is still this this thing of oh I don't maybe I don't want to go because I don't want to be it, it to yeah. feel like I need to go to that panel yeah yeah, and I think there's still people want to talk about it or are okay to talk about it, but often it's after a crisis or after yeah. something's happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, and really, the preventative stuff and the long term yeah. is, you know, if we're talking about it every day. And like, I don't. In five, one of the questions at the panel, which was interesting, was, where do you see the landscape in five years' time? And it was it's an interesting answer. And I think for me, a panel like that should almost be like those conversations should just be happening yeah not all the time but it shouldn't be a, a big thing that there's a panel talking about no. it no um, and it shouldn't be a first for account like it was the first for our yeah. county and yeah hopefully in five years time it's just a part of the conversation that you know we ask all our coaches to do safeguarding we ask all our coaches to have the dbs um i know as of next year i'm pretty sure there's a player welfare in open age football course that's coming in and it should just be part of that if you're going to accredit mm. a football club and if you're going to be involved in the game we want to support you and, and yeah. make sure you're just clued up on this topic as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the moment, I think there is, I feel there is still a bit of a stigma, particularly in the men's, in the men's yeah, game. Yeah. 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 Um, whether I can't speak for, for like say the women's game necessarily, but in the men's game, even at Didcot, where I'm kind of sponsor and it's great that they they've got that partnership with Restore. Even I think you know, you hear phrases sometimes. So I hear like, oh, the boy, like the, the lads really need to man up and just get into yeah. this game. And like, yeah. oh, that, that phrase is is a bit, you know, because yeah. it's just so really like embedded in the, you know, but, you know. I, th- I think that, that comes from blokes my age that, and I can say that because I'm that age, you know, it, it does, it, 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 I think, and that's come from their fathers, you know, the, the, the generation yeah. before them, because you you did just, man, you, had, you had to, there, were, there was no... There were no outlets like there are mm. like there are now. So, what did you do? And I've spoke to so many people my age that tell me about how they now saw how their father's mental health was really poor, and they were struggling, and they probably had clinical diagnoses that 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 weren't around now. Um, and I think like for me, when you said like what what you did with Wickham and the panel and and, and things like that. I, th- I think that's amazing. And you said, you know, it, where, where would you like to see it in five years time and people talking? I think that will become the norm because my my take on on, on what we talk about mental health is that it's a marketing exercise. And, and that's how I break it down simply. And, and I say to people, I say brands like Nike uh, who are embedded in English football from first yeah. men and women's first team. It's a very aspirational brand. And we all know what Nike is. We all know what Nike does. 
there's been a big furor about the the flag on the <laughs> yeah. back of the uh, back yeah, of the yeah. shirt. But ultimately, everyone knows what Nike is because it's in front of us all the time and they're brilliant at marketing. So Nike, Pure Gym, Adidas, Under Armour, yeah. Gymshark, they have monetized physical health to the point where people now actively, without even asking them, I'm going to gym, I'm taking a selfie, I've got the kit, I've got my bottle, you know, and the post on Instagram, we need to do we need to do that to, to mental health. You know, so people are actively talking about it, posting about it. And it's an aspirational part of the human psyche. It's the biggest part of the human psyche. So I think if, if you know, what you're doing and, and, and what County FA is, and, and I've seen what Barks and Books do, and they seem to be, you know, they, they are one of the ones that are doing the most. You can see that. It, it, it's only going to become the norm. You know, and, and it down, it's down to education. It's down to people understanding that phrases like, man up and um acceptable is wrong term but it's like it's like phrases around gender and and race that aren't acceptable now yeah. you know it, yeah. it's very similar yeah and i think it's um no i love what you say about the com uh, um, comparison i think you was it just this morning or or recently you released a video a clip about talking about that and the yeah the, the way that nike have monetized so yeah i'm loving that, that that's come up in this conversation as well and i think it's true because people see it it's almost like a I don't know it's like a flex or oh yeah I'm in the gym I'm working on my yeah. physical work, like yeah. Say it should be. yeah yeah and I think there is more of that now so you see people saying like oh but still I think there is this people would find it a bit more oh that's a bit different if someone was like mm. oh I had a great therapy session this morning yeah. and I yeah. had a really good yeah. chat and suddenly my head's clearer and but but that is a, that is also great like that's a, that's a, something to be proud of if you're taking that step yeah. to look after your mental health it's it's something that is just interlinked with that physical health as well. Yeah, yeah. So but it, I think, but what, yeah. what you said then, though, about someone posting and saying, I've just had a good session, I've cleared my head. It goes back to what you said right at the start of this about, you know, putting your head above, you know, yeah. the parapet or above the lines and, and taking that risk. And it's like we said, you know, I guarantee you that it's going to, someone else is going to go. So it's not just me. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've seen that so many times in, in, in things around, mental health and feelings and you know things like that that you just think oh it's not yeah. just me and I feel so much better now and and if more people did it more people would do it yeah. wouldn't they if you know people what I mean in position particularly in football I mean I know yeah. there's some great stuff going up like the heads up campaign and and there's a lot like Norwich City yeah. video it probably comes yeah. up like yeah, yeah brilliant um but also I think players talking about it but it's, yeah. it's a big thing yeah. for a player I've seen like recently Richarlison come out and talk about it and, yeah. and I mean I haven't looked at all the comments but I can imagine just you know with the social media and football that there, there'll be some comments in there yeah. which are you know negative when actually someone coming out and saying I'm looking to take care of myself and mm. and you know that that should be something that should be applauded in the mm. same way that, and I don't want to you know it's, it's a different topic but so you have like Jake Daniels at Blackpool and someone who's come out because no one should have to choose between being no. themselves and playing the game no. I was just going to say the same when you use that yeah, term yeah. coming out I was mm. just going to say the same Hans it is and, and it's yeah. a shame that 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 we are where we are with that because who, who cares whether you know who cares I, I don't I don't get it you know it's one thing that perplexes me is how people think it's or oh, you know to judge someone because yeah. they're not what people think is not normal what there's no such yeah. thing as normal no I think it's interesting that I had a conversation on my podcast with um Josh Parker he's a He's at Oxford City at the moment, but he said, and it, it, we had the conversation more around race because he's, um, he's from Antigua and Barbuda and he, he's felt that yeah. you know, he's had those experiences. He played in Eastern Europe when he was younger, yeah. so really was as a young kid. But when it comes down to that judging people, it's, it's almost like people often attach to something that's different. Yeah. But like, you know, when that becomes things that are like race or gender or, yeah. you know, like sexual orientation. Yeah. But, like the mental health one it's almost sometimes maybe people attack it because it's almost a fear of oh but i don't want to hear about that because and it, often it says more about the person doing the attacking than, than yeah. the person coming out and, well, it does and about it, it does. because it's why does that conversation why does that topic of conversation cause so much mm -hmm. angst for you kind of thing yeah it is it's it, I, and, and i um funny you should mention jake daniels because his, his agent is an ambassador for the vault billy okay and uh some of the stuff is is you know, Billy said to me about what Jake's had previously on social media. Um, horrendous. 
horrendous. And you know, you, you sort of think I can you know, there'll, there'll be there'll be thousands of you know gay footballers, won't there? And I can understand why they don't come out, you know, because like I don't give it, I don't care what someone is, as long as they're a nice person, Hans. I don't care. You know, I'm not painting myself to be this perfect person. I just don't. I don't give a shit. I yeah. honestly don't, you know. And I, and I just think it must be so difficult when you're in that position that, that you can't be yourself. Yeah, I think that's that's the main thing. And I think we we try as a – football needs to, to work towards that. And I, I'd like to think there's steps in the right direction. It's such yeah. a big plus because of the size of the game and the yeah. power of the sport. That there's positives mm. of that. There's also negatives. But yeah, no one should have to choose between being themselves and playing football. No, no. I think I think thing is with football though, it's it's like society's behind the curve on, you know, sexuality, gender, race, mental health. Uh, as society we're behind all this, we're not where we should be, are we? But football seems to be on everything behind society as well. You know, it seems to be football yeah. seems to be always be catching up where society is, and society is always catching up where we should be, and we're never going to be perfect as a. No. Oh, are we? No, but it is, yeah, it, it's just, you know, at the start of the podcast, you mentioned how busy you are. So you've got all <laughs> yeah. these things on and, you know, how how do you manage to find balance and take care of your mental health? You know, considering all these demands that you're putting on yourself, and I use that term, putting on yourself, you're choosing yeah. to, I'm not knocking yeah. that, you know, so you, you went from, you know, really, you know, burning out over the academia and and working six days a, a, a week 12 hours a day you've you've learned from that yeah. but then you're now involved in more things and i've got hands on my fingers on my hands how do you yeah. how do you deal with it so firstly why did do you keep yourself so busy and how do you mean how do you ensure that that doesn't take you back to where you were yeah um, so in terms of, I think, the balance, it, it can be with difficulty sometimes. It's definitely yeah. something that I I do struggle with. And I sometimes feel like if there's a line, I do sometimes mm. go a bit beyond that. Um, I fall back into that chasing the validation and yeah. wanting to, you know, make a difference. And, and particularly, I think I'm quite privileged in the position I'm in now that I'm I'm in a place where I'm acting on my purpose through my passions. Yeah. So my passion like is football. That. My passions are football and coffee, and my purpose is mental health awareness. Just can you just so, repeat that phrase to me? I love it. Yeah. So I'm acting on my purpose through my passions. Love it. Yeah. So that's what I feel I'm in. But sometimes that can be difficult because there's so much I want to do in this space, and there's so much I feel I can do. And for me, a quote that I really don't like is, "If you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life." For me. That is almost a dangerous message because yeah. even no matter how much you love what you do, rest and recovery is such an important yeah. part of, of keeping care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at athletes, to use the football analogy, yeah. you know, the rest and recovery, the amount of the, the size of the backroom staff now, and you've got all the nutritionists, the mm -hmm. psychologists now, which is great to see, the player care, that's that part of the game is, is really becoming important as yeah. important as the physical side and that's I think so important to look after these players because especially the young guys you're putting them in this environment and, and girls now now the women's yeah. games yeah yeah it's really interesting actually on the panel we had the Wickham Wanderers women's captain Bobby Lynch and she said that what she's noticed is since the, the growth of the Lionesses in the women's game some of those problems that you know we talk about the adults at youth football and things they would they tended to just be in the men's now yeah. it's, it's getting into girls football as well because mm. suddenly they think well, my little daughter can be the next lioness yeah. or yeah. something. So it's almost the as the game gets bigger and the exposure is more, you're gonna get more of the good, you're gonna get more of the bad. So yeah. Yeah. that's a new challenge for, for female players. But but for me, um yeah, the the balance is difficult. I do find that I'm mm. I'm still I can be quite cyclic in the way that I'll I'll go through periods of intense activity. Yeah. And then I'm have to catch myself and be like, whoa, whoa, let's just let's just slow down. Um, but my partner's huge on that. Um, she probably spots before myself. Yeah. Um, whether I am doing a bit too much. So for me, it's been learning to not take it personally, not see it as an attack, not see it. It's to actually 
listen and acknowledge yeah. okay maybe i am being a bit too busy yeah um, it's the me of when i was doing the academia stuff wouldn't have listened yeah have said, head down no. keep going yeah so so i think listening is really important reflecting on myself and just you know understanding the importance of rest and i like consistency can be a really good thing I know in Atomic Habits, they talk about consistency is better than intensity sometimes because yeah, yeah. the way I am, I'm a very intense and then I slow. Yeah. And intense. Yeah. But consistency or being steady, I always saw it as a negative. Yeah. I always saw it as being stagnant. I always saw it as being still and I saw it as not moving forwards. But yeah. really enjoying the consistency sometimes. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's something that I am trying to do more. Yeah. Just, yeah. Not every day I have to be, you know, changing the world. Yeah, that's not yeah. Possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think I think as humans though, we are. Life is a roller coaster. Yeah, I don't want to quote Ronan Keaton. It's an old adage, but it is, isn't <laughs> it? Life, the snow, <laughs> yeah, life is ups and downs, isn't it? You know, and 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 you know, people. I'll say, you know, the the key is finding that balance, that line of not doing too much, not doing. But no one's got that, have they? Yeah. So when you're saying you're going, you know, you're having intense periods of this and then a bit of a calm. I, I, I think that you acknowledge that and know that is showing. Not that you need me to tell you this, that you that you are, you know, you do know yourself. And it's just yeah. nice that that your partner will give you that little elbow and say, look, yeah. you've gone a bit too high now, just yeah. Yeah, yeah. slow down a bit. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, um something that that I did want to just say on that. Oh, lost myself, eh? Uh, where was I going? So I, I, what we said at the start, I, I interrupted your flow then, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's like, I think what I was saying with that. Um yeah yeah no i think um yeah with the that's what i was going to say so the in terms of the how do i keep the balance and i'm very yes. busy i think let me say about my purpose and and so things like my podcast i feel like conversations and conversations like we're having now they give me energy yeah. they don't take energy away so it's finding yeah. hobbies or finding things to do in my time that, that i feel like energize energize me and and that's a really nice, although it's busy, it's something that completely switches my mind off from work yeah. stresses, life stresses, yeah. and I can fully get into a conversation. So yeah, finding things that give me energy as well as take it away. Is yeah, because that, that that just, it's like, I, I always think that when, when you play football, you don't think about anything else. You know, I, I when I played when I was younger, you know, till I don't know what age I was, got too old to play, but whatever I had going on in my life, whatever I had in it, as soon as I started playing for 90 minutes, I didn't think about anything else apart yeah. from the game. And, and and that's the same thing as what you're saying about finding things that energise me and yeah, inspire yeah. you. And I can see when you're talking, then you when you're saying things, you know, you said then that this is not draining me, it's giving me energy. And I can see because you where you're talking, your whole face is lit up, your eyes are lit up, you know, literally. And you can see how, how much talking about and you expressing yourself he's giving you that that energy it's like people say you know start off the day you know going to the gym because it give you energy and you think hey but it's yeah. actually right you know it is isn't it you know you think i'm gonna be yeah, naked definitely. <laughs> definitely and i think it's that you know the like you said they're the way to use the analogy with physical health when you exercise your muscles you exercise everything like your brain's the same and i think yeah. um having these conversations but for me as well it probably shows how much i enjoy talking about this topic or, or yeah. find it really therapeutic in a way like this is therapy in a way yeah. having this deep yeah. conversation yeah. it is yeah. um, but as someone who for 22 years didn't do that no I didn't have that now I almost and we go back to that not really caring what people think as much now yeah. I'm like oh I can speak on my story I can yeah. talk about how I was feeling or yeah. how I feel and it's okay to do that and actually it's positive to do that it's more than okay um, but also so, you're an ex you're an expert on something you're an expert on you aren't you as well yeah, you know yeah. so no one you know the thing about mental health for me is that no one can tell you you're wrong because it's all i think it's all completely i said at, at this event i did the other day you know one of the things i say is like it's just like your fingerprint completely unique to you you know so exactly. no one can tell you that that you're wrong or right it's and, mm -hmm. and it's 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 who you are um so just as as we close hans and you know the last question is you know reflecting on your journey which we have done we've we've covered it brilliantly and the changes you've navigated both professionally and personally what advice would you give to others facing challenges that impact the mental health 
some yeah. nuggets we're after here. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things is, like we say, you create like a story for yourself sometimes. And so yeah. much of when I look back at my challenges, when I look back at how I dealt with it and what I would maybe advise or what I would say to my younger self, I know that's a common thing is, is that, um, you know, you, you create this story so, so you can change it. Yeah. And, and no one cares about what you're doing as much as you do in terms of, I felt that everyone would care about what my job was or what I was earning, what I was achieving. And no one cares about what you're doing. They care about who you are. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you've got those, that solid circle around you. Um, and even people, if you're unsure, you think, oh, I don't know if I want to put this on them. Trust me, they'll want to listen. They would yeah. rather hear it than, than, than yeah. find out down the line that you've been struggling. And yeah. That's something that for me was a massive change when I allowed myself to, um, to be vulnerable to, to those around me mm. uh, without that pressure on myself of again because I created the story of oh I'm an achiever and I do this and I'm going to do this and mm. and then, and yeah so that that for me would be a big big advice it's just it's yeah just be honest be honest with yourself yes yeah. well. be honest with yourself and it's okay if you're not thriving all the time it's okay if you're not always moving forward because um yeah, if you're honest with yourself, then you can be honest to others about how you're yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's a big thing, I think. Um, and not judging yourself because, you know, we're human at the end of the day. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. That's you, I, think, I think you bang on there about other people as well, because we all judge ourselves, but we're all judging ourselves against other people, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. You know, so so like you said, you know, I, I, and myself, I'll do it. And I think no one's got it figured out. No one. <laughs> not even the person that is the best in the world at what they do or whatever no mm -hmm. one has got it figured out so why am I different don't flatter myself Dan that I should have everything yeah, figured exactly. out and that's what that's what I say to people about worrying about what others think here I, you know I sometimes say look don't flatter yourself because they're they're more interested in themselves than you and that's not that it's just that we're all because they're they're not looking at you and going oh oh them pants are a bit tight and him oh that dress don't fit because they're so concerned that everyone's thinking about them that they're yeah. not actually okay. scrutinizing you they're scrutinizing like when you before you go out on a night you know you're checking does this fit all right do i look fat yeah i always look fat but never mind you know myself you know you do and and, and everyone else is is the same no matter how beautiful handsome successful rich whatever they are and and that's one thing that that we all need to try and deal with I think I totally agree yeah, with you definitely and that's that as well like you're not the I think it's my sister said this to me once I think she must have read it somewhere but she was like you're not the main you're not the main character in everyone's story like you you might worry about every little detail about this thing but yeah. to other people's lives they're, they're like you said you're not the main character in everyone's story like you're the main character in your story so just make sure you're looking after number one and be honest with yourself but um but yeah and another thing, I guess, if it was advice or whatever, it would be that you can still burn out doing something you love. Yeah, that, brilliant. That would be because I think just because, yeah, you love what you're doing doesn't mean that your body's going to, you know, that it's possible to be doing yeah. it 100% yeah. all the time. Because I love what I do, but I still struggle sometimes because, yeah. as you said, how much I'm taking on. Like, yeah. yeah. As so. it, if you go back to a fresh, professional footballer, they love what they do. But if yeah. they played football all day every day, the dead would be injured physically. Yeah, exactly. And like like what you've alluded to there is we do we're gonna burn out mentally. So we're gonna injure ourselves mentally like a footballer when they're playing 80 games a season, will invariably have injuries. And there's been so many one liners in this, it's been brilliant. Can you just remind me of that passion and purpose line? Because I'm gonna use that as the title for this podcast. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and again, so I think what and again, advice to people I would say is if you can find a way to act on your purpose through your passions, that's massive. Because Brilliant. find what you you want to find your why, um, yeah. and find what you're passionate about. If you can link them up, put yourself in a space where you're doing that, um, and you'll be all right. <laughs> you know what, right? I'm just thinking now, I can see a merch line with this. That like oh, you know you you, a, you should have I know you have but you should have that <laughs> on a t-shirt because yeah, what maybe. I'm th I'm thinking now right literally I'm thinking I can see a football mental health alliance hoodie with the football mental Alliance logo here that quote 
that you've yeah. said and then your name under that quote attributed to you maybe we'll see this, we're gonna start business dealings now <laughs> <laughs> i tell you that, that that i've just i can just see you know like you see i, I can see that I really am I can. Gonna have to put, am I got to make one with my Lego on it quick before you. Yeah, no, no, no. I'll, I'll credit you with it. Definitely, I'm, I'm going to mock that up and send it to you. Tell you, it's, yeah. that's a cracker. But I think that, yeah, act on your purpose for your passions, and it's so relatable to football. I think. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people have a passion about the game, but then it's just as well going back to the behaviour bit, and and don't let your passion overspill and then you know put someone else's out. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Because, especially as adults when you've got children and like and there's young people just have that accountability for your actions yeah. and uh, just think about the way what you're saying what you're doing can impact someone because it's a bit like with me and my my parents splitting and then for with me it wasn't what was said it was maybe what was not said yeah <laughs> but like and I don't blame and have a blame parents like you said the situation my mum was in was very yeah. difficult but even as an adult now that that does impact the way that I maybe see yeah. the world so you never know what might be said at a football game or yeah things like that yeah brilliant well hans can you just re tell everyone where we can find you then where we can find all these things you're doing yeah definitely so in terms of on the football side with barks and bucks fa so i'm on twitter at hans bbfa um and also if you go to kind of our, our account there you hopefully see some of the things we're doing um on instagram at cap and chino um and that's where you'll find me. And then the pod, the, in the bio of the um, the Instagram page, there's like links to the podcast and links to um, the the merch range and everything like that. And it, and proceeds from that and links to the coffee and proceeds from the coffee and the the merchandise go to Restore, which are a local Oxfordshire mental health charity. Fantastic. So, yeah, Cappuccino. Cappuccino. That's so where did the it. name come from? So like I said, when it first set up, it was initially to review cafes. So yeah. cappuccino, cappuccino, it just had a nice little ring to it, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is why it's quite funny now, though, because it's, it's it's really in that mental health space. And people like think of the name and they're like, well, what's that? But then the logo is the little coffee cup with the little yeah. um, thing. But again, to go more into that about sometimes a conversation over coffee, it's a great way to invite, yeah. like a, yeah. you know, to, to really just, it's therapeutic. Um, but that's what we do into as, as like one of our social things is is over a drink whatever that drink is yeah. a lot you know a, a, a lot of our social interactions are over mm -hmm. a drink do you want to go for a drink then that drink could be coffee it could be alcohol whatever mm -hmm. sit down having a meal so i think it's a perfect it's yeah. it's, seen, it's seen one of those things that maybe started off as something and has actually become perfect for what it is now if you know what i mean yeah, yeah it's grown organically there was no aim no. to do what i'm doing now when i said yeah that. yeah but so fantastic you know, carries on going that's that's what's exciting brilliant well hans I, I, I literally i could speak all day and i said oh 40 minutes it's now yeah, one hour 16 so good. sorry about that uh, but no thanks so much hans really really appreciate it really enjoyed it um been amazing the one line is in there i'm going to read you know go back through these and pick them out uh, we'll put links to everything that you're doing so hans cup thanks so much for this it's been amazing thank you hans thank you so much Right. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for the opportunity. And it's I've always enjoyed speaking on this topic. So, yeah, really. Cheers, it. buddy. Thanks, mate. Bye.